Welcome everyone to episode number 78 of the Single Malt Strategy Podcast. Today I have with me as always my trusty co-host. I, that feels weird to say actually. I, I should say I, the trusty co-host, am with the normal leader, Matt. How are you doing, Matt? Um co-host is fine. I mean you're the you're the you're the lead guy on this one, right? So like that would make you the host. I, I mean I guess I spoke first if that's what you're referring to, but I, I prefer to like defer all responsibility for negative things that we say to you. And that's why I prefer to just be the co-host. Whereas, you know, the full blame of everything falls on you, the host. I guess. I mean my head is at like when someone's in their car on their way to work because they're listening to this at like seven in the morning we might be the first voice that they hear whose voice will that be it'll be your voice that's horrifying i'm so, so sorry oh my gosh well look at if they're if they this is episode number 78 if they've come this far then i guess they know what they're getting themselves into can you imagine being the first voice that some ra- you know some random person hears when they wake up no I, I guess i've never thought about it yeah i mean i don't know where i'm going with that so that's all i got well, let's quickly <clears throat> avoid any awkward pause here by bringing in our third person. The guest for today is a first time appearance. The man, the myth, the legend known only as what What do you want to be known as? Most people will know me as Alekius, but I am willing to go by first names today. So this may come as a surprise. My real name's not Alekius, but you can call me Tony. Oh, great. Well, Tony. Um, now, actually, quick backstory on Tony and myself, Eric. We've met in real life. This is one of the very few people I've actually met in real life. I think I was your first fan that you physically saw face to face. Yeah. And, you know, this is why I don't want to see any other fans. <laughs> no, no, no. That's not true. <laughs> We met for tacos. It was delicious. Yes. Um, now, like, I mean, Tony, how much um, about people do you want to reveal? Do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself, why you're on this podcast? A fan of strategy gaming, obviously. The fan of gaming, period. People who have seen my YouTube will have noticed the icon is ATG. I went back and forth about what that actually stands for quite some time. The T stands for tinkering because I do absolutely nothing optimally i'm always messing with it strategy is perfect great it worked this time let's do something different next time just oh it fell on its face uh, oh well let's try something new now it, i i can't just leave a strategy well enough alone and i think you're well known and beloved for that for your for the people who watch you i i, I don't know why they they're so attracted to uh suboptimal play but i like to consider it realistic well in the event that anybody doesn't know um, where can they find you? Um, on YouTube, uh, if you do a search for A L E K I U S, you will see the blue dot with A T G in white. That's me. And I want to rehash for people that your name is Alekius. We, we will try to call you Tony, but since you've only ever been Alekius to most people, including me, except for that one time at the taco shop. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> But it's the same thing with my my name. We go back and forth. Nobody really calls me Eric. I'm just Tortuga. All right. Well, let's start off, um, get things rolling by talking about what we've been playing lately. And since you, Tony, are the guest of the hour, why don't you talk about anything you've been playing for the last month or so? Well, uh, I've been playing a lot of Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020. I don't know why Microsoft decided to uh, drop a number and just call it Microsoft Flight Simulator for literally... I'm pretty certain it's the longest running series in computer gaming. They, their first one, Microsoft Flight Simulator, same title as they have now. It's like 1982 or three or something. And, and the, everybody just calls it 2020. Why didn't they just leave that in? It's neither here nor there. But I, I've been really enjoying that uh, beautiful game. Absolutely stunning. And um, some of the... Third-party purchasable aircraft are considered study level by pilots in the industry. Not meaning that it would count as simulator time for them, but that like all of the bells and whistles work exactly like they would in real life, which I found amazing. So I've been learning how to do all sorts of like air navigation and such. It's it's been my passion lately, as well with uh, what I've been doing with my channel, which is Shadow Empire. It's been my long-running series for 
currently, as well as some Distant Worlds 2. Thank you, Slytherin. They gave me an early access to their new DLC, so I've been exploring that. And then because I've been into airplanes recently, like Airbucks, Aerobiz Supersonic, Airport Tycoon, Airline 7, I've I just, I've been trying to find some sort of tycoon type game that would scratch that itch, but nothing's really been sticking yet. Yeah. Funny you talk about tycoon stuff. Cause I've kind of had the same thing and I guess I'll, I'll go into what I've been playing lately. Cause this is perfect segue. I have been doing the same thing, but for railroad type stuff for, for trains. And the thing I, I've been playing lately, uh, which has been surprisingly better than I expected as a way of scratching that tycoon itch, especially for trains is Railway Empire. And it's a game I actually played like a year ago or more than a year ago and kind of like poo-pooed it a little bit. Didn't really think it was all that great. And I don't know what I don't know what I was looking at or what changed. Maybe the game has been updated and just it clicked better. I don't know. It's one of those rare moments where you put a game down and then you come back and you actually really enjoy it the second time you pick it up, which for me is not usual. Usually it's oh, I really should give this a second try and then no, no, no. It really <laughs> it was better to leave this <laughs> as a first try only. Um, so Railway Empire is one of the things I've been playing, really enjoying that. Otherwise, I have like no free time. So <laughs> I haven't really played anything else. I guess I played a little bit of Mech Warrior 5, which is just an action game, but a little bit of Battletech, which actually drove me to play Mech Warrior 5. And that's probably it. So Matt, why don't you pick up where I'm leaving off? I mean, I haven't been playing a lot lately. Um, well, that's not true. I have not been playing a wide variety of games. I have been playing a lot lately. Um, your favorite game. Oh, I know. Uh, actually, I think both of your favorite game. Oh, brother. Uh, Ultimate Admiral Dreadnoughts. Yeah, I mean, I guess the stunned silence is, uh, is you know, indicative of your excitement level. I actually love the game. Really? I'm one of the weirdos that really likes it. I was never sold on the campaign. And so like the game's great to me. Oh, okay. So you haven't, you don't play the campaign. No, the campaigns. So you don't play the campaign at all. I, I've tried. It suffers the same flaws I see in rule the waves. That is true. They, they found all of the problems that rule the waves had and they made them. And none of the solutions, mind you. Correct. They didn't ever decide to solve things like auto resolve. Well, I guess auto resolve isn't that. I guess auto resolve, it's solved in rule the waves because I solved it. So auto resolve is in Ultimate Admiral, but it's very bad. Yes, it is. Like, yeah, that's what I've heard. It's terrible. <laughs> I was playing. I was- I was playing a campaign the other day, and um, and uh, there was a single torpedo boat of the enemies against I want to say literally like twenty ships of mine and a half, like ten. It was like five battleships, like ten armored cruisers, three light cruisers, and the auto resolve somehow had a single enemy torpedo boat. It didn't sink anyone, thank goodness, but it had a single torpedo boat damage like twelve different ships. <laughs> including two capital ships heavily damaged where I like, I don't think they had enough torpedoes to do what they did. <laughs> who, who's writing these auto resolve? I, I like, um, I speak from experience here that I, I mean, I've written an auto resolve for rule the waves that I consider pretty decent. I mean, it's not great. I think it needs more testing to be good, but I don't understand how somebody can write something that bad. I, I just, you should be able to give auto resolve. It's just, it's a pretty simple task. I think. You should be able to give it to like an intern and they should be able to develop your auto resolve. And you know, what's interesting about that. It's not like auto resolve is this new concept, like even ignore strategy games for a second. Auto resolves have been around as long, basically as long as any sport games have been around and sporting games are remarkably complex when it comes to like all the different variables that come into play. And yet it seems like most sport games do a very good job with auto resolve. And it's not just like, you know, the behemoths like EA making auto resolve for like Madden or whatever, like a lot of small studios, the guys behind out of the park baseball, they've had auto resolve forever. And that was always a really small team or baseball mogul. Again, I think that's like a one or two person team and they have very good, you know, you don't look at the auto resolve and say like, what the hell's happening here? And I don't know. To me, it seems like it shouldn't be that complex. I have a theory here, which is just. I just developed it, but I think it holds. Auto resolve, I think knowing how to make a good auto resolve requires that you know statistics. And maybe it's just not the case that a lot of people writing game code 
for something like Ultimate Admirals Dreadnoughts. I mean, most of the game, the real-time strategy game, I don't know how much statistics you need to know. And that's what I even was kind of alluding to when I said I need more testing to make mine better. You kind of have to know about probabilities, what you're doing. I mean, this I guess it should be at least some elementary form of understanding of statistics should be necessary for anyone who has RNG in their game. But I, I, anyway, I think that a successful auto-resolve is all about knowing how to make the statistics work in a meaningful way. So I think that, therefore, st- statistics are necessary and understanding of them. But I don't know. And anybody writing a sports game, because a lot of those all have like stats, right? Like zero to 100 and different attributes. I feel like those kind of people are the people who would know statistics. Just a theory, though. That's uh, interesting because uh, one of the ones I wanted to bring up because it only has auto resolve is Dominions. And even the Dominions games, the battles are all auto resolve. You get some influence in how to set up where units start and what actions they're supposed to take, but that's giving orders to the AI who actually executes it. Yeah, that's. I have not actually played any of the Dominions games, but I've heard good things. I like it, and I I think being able to see the auto resolve and review how it happened takes those edge cases where you're like, that's outrageous, and, and you can actually see how it went down. I think that demystifies it a lot. And uh, to Tortuga's point, like I think they they really paid attention to the statistics of it because it's nothing but auto resolve. So they had no choice. Yeah, and I also think that the Dominions people are very good with their. I mean, their the AI isn't like great, but they managed to make the tactical system work given the orders. Because uh, in that one, you have the since you're actually seeing it play out, you have people going, moving, and attacking. And they made it, it's very simple, but it's, it were it's functional. And yeah, I do agree, by the way, that seeing it play out, not only is that helpful for the player, I can imagine that's very helpful for debugging and figuring out what the hell's going on yourself. Speaking of debugging, I also imagine that the games where auto resolve seems to do the worst, something like Ultimate Admiral, that game's focus is clearly playing battles in 3D. Right. The core of that game is about playing those battles out. And so they have an auto resolve, perhaps because they realize the campaign's going to be too grindy if they don't have one. But I imagine the vast amount of their time and effort went into not doing the auto resolve and the auto resolve maybe kind of feels a little bit like a an afterthought. Just a thought. But I will say, like, I don't want to do the whole episode on Ultimate Admiral Tortuga, but I've been playing it. I've been playing as a campaign. It's actually been doing really well streaming like a lot of people seem to really want to watch this game which kind of makes me i wonder if it's because the game is pretty pretty good looking regardless of whether it's always fun to play and i wonder if it's a game where it's like hey it's more enjoyable to watch than it is to actually play sometimes when you're fighting you don't have to fight the game right but i do find the ui just abysmally bad i also find the campaign a little grindy but it's also kind of interesting like the ai wars add such a huge thing to it because i mean i had this instance where i was in the middle of a war with italy and then some tension thing got triggered and all of a sudden the entire world was at war it went from being a 1v1 regional war to literally the u.s and the british were both fighting each other and also italy Germany got in the war, the Soviet Union got in the war, Japan got in the war, and it was this trigger where it just all happened at once. And I just had this moment of like, holy fucking shit, like nothing like that could ever happen, at least not right now, in Rule the Waves. And it was a pretty cool moment. I do think, you know, the game is certainly flawed in many ways, but it does have an appeal, even if the AI is not always great. I actually also think they do a pretty decent job with like the technology clearly making older ships obsolete. I've noticed as my wars progress, as time moves on, you can really feel your ships getting older, getting obsolete, not holding their own in the battle line. And suddenly these newer designs are just stomping them and it can happen pretty quick at times. Like I think it does a decent job of, of sort of conveying the importance of upgraded technology. And so like I have major reservations with the game still, Uh, But I am finding as I'm playing it more like there are some redeeming qualities about it that that kind of keep me coming back. Even if I would 100% agree the game is not anywhere near finished and I worry it's going to be abandoned before it ever is. And when you say that 
AI wars doesn't exist in real waves. Have you heard? <laughs> I'm talking the base game, Tortuga. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. But it's so it, what you're saying is exactly right, though. That's the reason why I don't. I didn't ever have a desire to write those two mods, Auto Resolve and AI Wars for World of Waves. But it just, it's to me, it was obvious. Obviously, to me, I thought that they were very important, very huge missing components of the of the game. Uh, it is just because the developer of Rule Waves obviously is focused on different things, not on the strategic level so much. So it, in, in his mind, it probably doesn't matter. But those things are supposed to make their appearance in Rule Waves 3. Yes, they are. And so that's that's exciting. We'll see. I wonder if they will release into early access. So you wonder if, uh, R- R- if Rule the Waves will release into what again, Tortuga? I wonder if it will release into early access otherwise known as early ass because that's my thoughts on early access lately which is the title of this episode right you're you, i hope you're posting this as early access or early access i was thinking about why do all games suck now okay all right but they all suck because they're all early access but that's not necessarily true because actually distant worlds 2 is not early access is it I don't think so. I think it's full release. Oh, no. What's your definition of early access? Oh, gosh. Yeah. Basically, everything is crap, which you already know, because that was my <laughs> that was my opinion on everything last episode, which, OK, I'd like, I, let me reel back. Obviously, that's not true. We don't need this fatalistic viewpoint this time. So I guess the question that I had, like this was this the reason I posed the question are all why are all early access games bad? Which I don't think they all are. No. What I have noticed over the last, I don't know, maybe year or so, maybe a little more, is it seems like when games release, it's uh, let's let's step back. A couple of years ago, when early access first started, I don't know, it was like four or five years ago when it first started becoming. No, no. Early access, I think, became popular maybe like 2015, maybe even 2000. Has it been that long? Oh, my God, I'm old. It, it's been a while. Okay. So when everything started switching over to early access, I do feel like, you know, whether it was seven years ago or what, whether I'm ancient and buried by the, the time this podcast airs, I do feel like when it first started, there was a lot of goodwill that gamers had around it. Games would come to early access, but like people didn't trash games in terms of reviews. People didn't say like, oh, this is incomplete or this is terrible or whatever. And then you had games that like didn't technically go to early access, but were very clearly early access, like CK2, you know, when it was like, oh, you can only play as the Christian countries. And like, but the mechanics for all the other countries were clearly there. They just didn't let you play as them yet. And, and so like, I feel like, and that was, that was going back even further, right? Like CK2 was what, like 12 years ago? I guess my point is, it seemed to me like when early access first started and you had games like Ultimate General Gettysburg going through it and Ultimate General Civil War, um, there was a general degree of acceptance from gamers where it was kind of like, all right, well, we know it's not finished, but we're excited that we get to play it sooner. We might have, if, especially if it's a smaller studio, we might have some influence over the game actually as it's being finished. And it feels like over the last maybe two or three years, that sentiment has vanished entirely. Wasn't didn't didn't happen instantly, but like I said, over the last two or three years, gamers seem to have gotten much less accepting of games coming to release when they are not finished, of paying money for early access, even though everybody's still doing it, because developers are still doing it. So presumably they're making pretty big chunks of cash. And it seems like maybe games are more and more like unfulfilling in that regard. Like, you know, I, the, the reason this all came up was because we just had a series of games release company of heroes, three Kerbal space program manager two. And I think it was what bloodborne three or blood bowl three. Yeah. Blood bowl three. And like each one of those games got absolutely <laughs> eviscerated to varying degrees, but like each one of those games got pretty, pretty, pretty heavy criticism. Well, before you go too deep, I I, I just want to uh, step back for a second. And like why when early access games were first released, people had goodwill. And I want to make this short also because I'm sure Alekias has an opinion on it. But I I think that briefly, I would have to guess that early access games start off when they were first done. They were done by professionals with people who had real serious intent. And there wasn't already a market 
for people to, t- to abuse. But then as with everything, when people started doing it right, that bought people's goodwill so that people could do it wrong. And I think that we're just probably in maybe an oscillatory cycle that'll happen forever now. And we're just in a downswing where people are just abusing the early access. There'll be a pushback where people stop doing as much. Actually, I'm not even sure if it's an oscillation. It might just be this is just the, the new norm. Yeah, I think that what happened is that people got so used to releasing early games that developers thought that they could get away with more and eventually all the goodwill was chewed up. It's my two cents. I, I think there's multiple factors there. And I really surprised myself when I sat down and thought about it and actually like wrote down these are early access games that worked and here's ones that didn't. And okay, well, what are the goods and bads for early access? And my opinion's not too far off. Like, I think it is good for the industry and gamers because it helps indicate what people are interested in rather than subject to what marketing thinks is viable and what industry studies think is a viable game by lowering that barrier for new developers with a unique interesting idea. And ultimately that's hoping that we get a larger beta phase and a tighter fighter final product. But you see all these cash grabs, shovelware, bait and switches. Don't get me started on Fortnite. And it, it skews things tremendously. And I, I think the market is just kind of fed up with it. I'm a little torn on this. If I had to say like what games I played in early access that seemed to get the best reception and seemed to do a good job of it, I would use, and I'm going to use three games, two, two positives, one negative. I'm going to use three games as sort of a, an example, the two positive all by the same developer. The two positives are, I would say, uh, ultimate general Gettysburg and ultimate general civil war. And they got really positive reviews. And I think the reason for that is their approach to those games. The UI stuff wasn't fully finished on on either of the games, but basically their approach was we have a functioning and they were basically real time battle games um, with with sort of linked battles or campaigns or whatnot. One had had linked battles, the other had uh, or linked linked scenarios and the other had linked battles. And their approach seemed to be, we have a functional battle system, but we haven't had time to like get all of the, all of the game, all of the scenarios built up. So like, we're still working on scenarios. We're still tweaking some of the features, but fundamentally it's a functional game. You can play it. You can enjoy yourself and have a good time. Even though like you can't finish the campaign, you can't fight all the battles. You can't do everything, but like functionally you can jump in and you can play it. Like that was my memory of these games. Ultimate Admiral Dreadnought, on the other hand, did not have a good early access period. Now, they Game Labs does, does weird things where, like, you can buy directly through their website earlier. And so, like, it's kind of like a hidden early access at first. But Ultimate Admiral Dreadnoughts didn't. And I think the problem with Ultimate Admiral Dreadnoughts is, like, they released sort of chunks of battles being able to be fought through, like, this academy system. But what everybody kind of wanted was the campaign. And they took, like, two years to get to the campaign. And then they kind of like release the campaign in a half baked format. That is nothing like what the final version of the campaign was like just to have a campaign. It seemed like, and then like two and a half years later, they finally released like an actual global map campaign. The AI was still really struggling with it. So like, I think in, in that scenario, I guess what I'm saying is in the first two examples where it worked, they played, they had a game that was functional played was satisfying, just was incomplete in the case that didn't work. They had an incomplete game with an incomplete experience with some features that worked and they took two years to get to the thing that everybody wanted them to get to in the first place. And they they released like several half broken versions of it along the way. And so I think based on that, what early access, like what people I think to I think to a large degree where people are getting frustrated with early access is probably around like quality control of like if you're going to ask me to pay you for money, there's got to be something I can play and enjoy. And it can't just be like a half-baked idea. Oh, I'll ask you to pay me for money, all right. I'd like to use another example due to the same kind of thing because at first I was struggling to think of an example, but we already have one right in front of our face. Same company. Let's compare Kerbal Space Program 2 with Kerbal Space Program 1. 
So I think this is actually a really good example of where early access has gone. Early access used to be Kerbal Space Program 1. It used to be really small dev teams. This, I mean, KSB was started off as a one-man project. I think he was just taking some physics simulator and making it work for space travel type stuff. And that's pretty cool. And I think that people, you know, they, they really like the idea. They get behind it. And then they support what they realize because the dev team is not seasoned development team. They support this person slowly making what they see as a really cool idea. And they see that this person is passionate about it. They want to support that. So that is to me like the, the, the previous, the beauty of early access, what it used to be and what like I think it's best used for. Um, another example of this is Prison Architect, just to say, and I think RimWorld, another great example. These are all like small dev teams that people were supporting that, that they had a good idea. They had like some placeholder art on some stuff and all this. But the, the basic game loop looked interesting and people were willing to buy into it. Can I and I don't want to like interrupt too much, but I, I do want to just add that that was true of of Ultimate General Gettysburg too. It was like the first game I think by Game Labs might have been Naval Action, and it was like this m- guy who had been a modder for Total War was really passionate about making this game, and he was able to make it through Game Labs. So like very similar situation. But now early access has become Kerbal Space Program Two. This is a team that's been working on the project. For five years, it's a team that probably is more than 10 people. It's like a real, I mean, this is by take two. I mean, not, it's not the dev team is in take two. Take two is probably embarrassed that they decided to publish this, but this is like a seasoned, this is the exact opposite of the first games, right? You have what should be basically a, not AAA, but it's at least a functional professional dev team that has put together something. Not only that, it's not a new idea. They're, this is a sequel. They, they just need to take what was already good and then make it better or at least redo it with better graphics. I mean, I mean, it, it, it doesn't seem like the mission statement for KSP2 is, is that much to ask for. I mean, it's basically just have some programmers and iterate on something that was already done. That's kind of a cool. Everyone likes reboots. I mean, I, I now work in software development and I, I, everyone loves when you have a chance to rewrite from scratch because I can can tell you it's a pain in the ass to look at someone else's code. So I'm sure that's exciting. But then they they call this an early access release after already having developed something for a long time and trying to make it with good graphics. And obviously they have this huge marketing or creative aspect to it because they've released like these really interesting videos and all that. So I mean, this is not like a one man effort or even just a couple of developers in their basement making it. This is like a real studio. And And then when you then bring something crappy to the table coming from a professional team, I think that we rightfully are very upset when that is what the new face of early access is. It's just crappy professional dev teams releasing crap. I'm paying for a beta. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not even a beta. I, I think that... An alpha? Because a beta probably assumes... I mean, I don't know. These terms are kind of like jargon. It doesn't really matter. They mean what you want them to mean. But, in, but typically, alpha means it's not feature complete. And beta means it's feature complete. But, you know, we need to... We It's not bug tested all the way. So, yeah, these are alphas. I mean, a lot of early access titles would be considered alphas in that they're not feature complete. And that used to be the difference, by the way, between full releases and and like expansions, that you would get new features and expansions or in DLC. But I don't know, all these lines have been blurred, so it's it's hard to really say anymore. Kind of doing the same thing because I want to highlight a a point. Those passion projects, they're still around. I just think they're kind of stuck in a sea of, of a lot more going to early access to capitalize that and I, I want to get to that point here in a moment but you have things like oxygen not included which was in early access for a really long time before it it uh fully came out and it went through a lot of iterations and was very very basic when it first hit early access but it's been highly successful and well liked from what i've seen to get to real small projects, you have Gear City, which I think you've talked about before during uh, your episode on Tycoon Games. A small, I think it's one guy. I, I think he he subcontracts for like art assets or something. 
But Gear City's really small tycoon game, passion project, very clear vision, Factorio, small development team. It's not just one guy, but they had a very clear vision. They took the time to do it right, and the quality tells. And you compare that with uh, some of the other things that have come out that fell flat on their face, and it's what are the differences there? Because uh, you do have those passion projects that fold under, like uh, Nomoria was like a Dwarf Fortress-like uh, game that was in develop- early access for a really long time, was one of those passion projects, but folded under for reasons I, I didn't keep close tabs on it. But it folded. The developer stopped working on it. And it, it, it'll never be completed. Whereas you have the bigger example of like Sword of the Stars 2. Supposed to be, it's supposed to be one of those iterative things. Let's just take the previous title. We'll redo it. We'll make better graphics. We'll, we'll make it better fidelity, better UI. We'll just make the last game, but better. And it had kind of a release that looked a little bit like KSP2s. And the publisher pulled. And I think that's one of the pitfalls of what we're seeing with early access in that if you have a passion project, you do the early access because you need to spend more time on to really actually complete a game unless you're Tarn Adams, and it is your magnum opus. It is what you will work on for the rest of your life. Not everybody can do that. And so you release into early access as a really small developer, and you hope to get people to buy into it so that you can spend more time on it. You don't need to have a separate job, or a full-time job at least. Or you can afford to subcontract to get art assets or specialized AI programming. And from the bigger studios, I'm wondering if there's this push for publishers to be like, all right, we've spent X number of dollars, X number of years. You're now a risky investment. We need you to go early access and see what the market says. And that will determine your fate of your development team. And I'm wondering if that's happening more and more for publishers to defray the risk with the public and i don't think that's always fair but what do you guys think well i I do think you nailed it with (laughs) publishers pushing people to just do early access as like a way of mitigating risk but i want to talk about i want to like shift a little bit to why maybe it's, it's kind of the same question what do we think right um why have there been more failures lately though because it it is true matt already brought this up but we had three enormous failures this month Blood Bowl 3, Kerbal Space Program 2, and then Call of uh, Company of Heroes 3, right? I don't don't know much about Company of Heroes 3, but I did look into Blood Bowl 3 I was interested in and was kind of following, and certainly following Kerbal Space Program 2. And these are just, I mean, it could be a coincidence, but I, I think we should at least ask the question, why are these early access games, especially by bigger studios or like by bigger groups of people failing so much like this year, this time. And Matt, do you have a thought on that? And here's a spoiler or not really a spoiler, but someone might be yelling at their, uh, at their speaker right now. You'll notice two of those three failures weren't early access games. Company of heroes three is not listed as early access on steam. Neither is blood blood bowl. Oh, okay. Well, you know, that makes me very awkward for me. Doesn't it? <laughs> I think what it comes down to fundamentally, I think there's two things. The first, I think you already touched on a bit, uh, Alekias. So I'll come back to that. But I think the second is qual is uh, quality control. So we say like, why are these early access games failing? But then you look at like Imperator Rome, which was not paradox doesn't do early access, right? Like they're always quote full releases. I think a lot of Paradox fans would tell you they're not full releases, but regardless, they're at least nominally a full release. Company of Heroes 3, full release. Blood Bowl 3, full release. And yet they still do very poorly. And then also KSP 
two, that was early access and then that failed too. I think a lot of it comes down to quality control. I think people are willing to play a game if it's in early access and incomplete as long as like there's a sense that it was ready for people to play it and pay for it. So like being feature incomplete could be fine. KSP one was completely feature incomplete. Like I, I don't let's not have rose colored glasses about what KSP was when it first came out. Like I don't know that it was any more complete than it is than KSP two is. You know, it was very incomplete when KSP one came out and it took a very long time to get to this, the stage of being complete. So I, I guess I'm rambling here a bit. I think it comes down to quality control and expectation management. People didn't expect KSP one to be done because it was a small team. And so people gave it a large amount of goodwill. KSP two had presumably a multi-million dollar budget because KSP one was so successful. They had, as you pointed out already, a large development team, certainly larger than they had before, plenty of resources, and they spent years upon years working on it. And after all of that hype and all that expectation and presumably all that money poured into it, it was no better off than the original KSP was. And so naturally people, you know, one guy working on it, people are going to give him a lot of goodwill. 20 guys working on it and spending tens of millions of dollars and a whole bunch of marketing behind it. And people are going to be like, what the fuck is this? Um, I think you have the same thing with Company of Heroes 3. The game released, and there was some positive sentiment from some, I believe, I believe mostly they were like Company of Heroes 1 fans who were, who were more forgiving of it because they like some of the gameplay changes and styles and it kind of harked back to the original a bit. And, and again, there was some there was some positivity around it, but like the campaign was full stop broken. Um, and, you know, it, it felt like maybe they over promised early, couldn't figure out how to get the campaign to work. And then presumably their publisher was like, you've spent enough time on this. Start making money. Figure it out post launch like that. I would guess that was part of it. But again, Company of Heroes, probably the biggest budget RTS out there. Maybe close to it this year probably certainly yeah i mean uh, i guess if we want to classify total wars uh, as an rts because it has that too then maybe not but like there's not a lot of, of those style of games out there that get the amount of money that they got behind it right you could probably count them on one or two hands so again i think it comes down to expectation management if you've got a big team and you've got a big budget and you're going to release a game and it's not complete whether it's early access or whether it's nominally a full release people are going to expect a lot more than you know when you're sitting you're you're one dude or or you're just you know a very small independent you've kind of ticked off a a a brain spark in my head that made me think with expectation management specifically and i know i personally i i hate early access I hate the extended development cycle of we release the game, but we're going to be working on it and changing core game features 15 years later. I hate that. I want to know what I'm actually buying, but I understand that it's good for the industry as a whole, but expectation management. Is it? It's good for small. I believe there are use cases where it is good for the industry. And I believe those use cases are for small individual developers, but is it good for the industry as a whole? Cause what I worry is I worry it destroys any goodwill or willingness to believe in an idea early on because people get burned so much just by the concept of early access that they stop going to it. If it was, and I think this is how it originally started when steam first started it. If it was limited to small developers in these, Okay, but the fact that it's like used by large studios, it probably has this reputation. I mean, first of all, the first games were all the first early access games were small studios. And also in my brain, I don't know if this happened with anyone else, but I kind of mingled the idea of early access with like the Steam Greenlight program. And I don't think that exists anymore. Or if it does, I don't know. Yeah, it doesn't. Okay, but anyways, that those kind of were like the same idea where you had these small projects. It's kind of like the original GoFundMes or what it's not GoFundMe. What's the video game version of that? 
I mean, people use Kickstarter too. Kickstarter, thank you. That's the kick. That, so Kickstarter, I mean, there's originally these games that were small, but then, you know, one of the games that was not small that used Kickstarter, Star Citizen, which I feel like if we're going to talk about releases gone bad, we have to talk about, or at least mention, I don't want to talk about it, no. but let's just at least mention that Star Citizen is a potential release forever. You know, it's, <laughs> it will never actually be released, but. Hey, I watch a lot of classy packs on Twitch and he's like now a Admiral something or other ambassador. He seems to like it. Seems like a lot of people are starting to like it. Okay. Well, that's, that's good news, but let me get to my, I, <laughs> I want to defend myself. I want to do a little marketing here, or I don't know if this is marketing. This is um PR. You say that those games weren't early access. And I say, what is early access? But no, but seriously, I don't know what early access even means nowadays. Um, a game, games which come out as full releases should have been early access and games which come out in early access seem like they should have been full releases. It doesn't make any sense. There's like, it doesn't seem to be any logic to it. I mean, there there is a little bit. You can, in general, maybe expect that an early access release will be in worse shape than a full release. But explain to me how, you know, stuff like Blood Bowl 3 happens then. Explain to me how these other releases, which were really bad, happen. I mean, they're basically early access releases. And then you have some early access releases like the demo, not even early access, but the demo for Manor Lords was probably better than most games I played last year. I don't know. The the quality is all over the place and it doesn't really seem to map to early access or not anymore, which just kind of muddies the water even more, which also means that pretty much anybody can call themselves early access. It the game the term has lost meaning, so why not just say early access as a defensive point? I always thought that it would be smart for a company to release to early access purely for defense mechanism. If something doesn't go right, you can always be like well, it's just early access. Even if you intended it for it to be a release and you had like some schedule of maybe, maybe you release a little bit early and you have some a little bit of content you can claim is going to be coming in the future, but you basically just do a normal release and call it early access. It seems like a brilliant way of just mitigating or just doing damage control. If there's a poor release, you just say, okay, well, you know, early access for three months or whatever. And I think even wasn't the Civil War. What was it? Grand Tactician of the Civil War? Yeah. What, weren't they like originally going to be on a, a pretty quick timetable for release? And then they ended up being in early access for a couple years. And I don't even know what their release out of early access meant because they're still kind of like developing the game um, in early. So in early access, they didn't have all the campaigns. They didn't have all the battles. They didn't have all the maps. But like I would almost use that as a good example of early access in the sense that like it was buggy as hell. It was a very small development team, too. I think there was like one programmer. So again, that kind of goes back to like, you're going to get more goodwill. Also kind of a one of a kind game. Like there's no other civil war games out there that try to have a grand strategy map with real time combat. Like that just doesn't happen. So I think there's a lot of goodwill for that too. Yeah. I think it was a good, it was early access. Well done. I don't want to like besmirch them. I just was trying to say that I'm not sure if they're a good example of this or not, but it didn't seem clear to me that uh, their early access was like the clear, I mean, they, they did early access, and then when they were out of early access, was that transition, was it meaningful? Maybe it was. I mean, it, it certainly it meant something for them, because I know that they had like this new release on Steam, and it was supposed to be a big deal. But is it just a way to re-release your game, or was it like the development really on new, new um, items? Does it really stop? Is the game really feature complete after early access becomes full release? I, I kind of get the feeling that none of that matters anymore. That and, and a lot of people, we've seen this too, Matt. We've looked at this for what game was it? I forget. We looked at how games launched in early access and then when they're released, their popularity is much less when they're released versus when they go on early access. Because early access is essentially just a release. And the official release marketing way of getting your name back on the steam page basically right i think there's another aspect going on there where early access is potential there's all the potential in the world i can see this developer wrote down a whole bunch of stuff they're putting out diaries they have all these dreams hopes and aspirations 
And then one day they wake up and they're like, wow, this is printing money. And those hopes, dreams, and aspirations start to push higher and higher until they've either overreached or they burn out. Or they get hundreds of millions of dollars and do nothing. Buy Bugattis and beach houses? I don't know. What did Star Citizens spend their money on? I don't know, honestly. It's got a nice car, though. No, I think you're right to some extent. I wonder, though, that's interesting that you bring up like, oh, you have all these great ideas and so people buy your game. Does that are charlatans just using early access to be like, Hey, I have these ideas, but I'm completely incapable of ever, ever like upfront. Just there's no way I'm ever going to be able to do this. But the fact that my ideas are making me money, even though I don't have the ability to execute on it. Like, dude, who's that guy, Eric, whatever his name is, the developer who has these ideas, he got into a fight with the star citizen main guy. I honestly don't know much about star citizen. I mean, it's not the star system. There's a guy who has all these ideas and they're like kind of interesting, but then he can't develop them for crap. And if you say his name three times. Oh, you're talking about the guy who did Battle Cruiser? Derek? Yes, Derek. What's his name? Yeah, 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 yeah. Him and Peter Molyneux. That they have huge dreams. I was going to say Molyneux, but Molyneux actually delivered. Yeah, at least Molnu delivered. <laughs> when? Well, black and white. I mean, uh, something, yes. His dreams, no. <sighs> no, yeah, yeah, no. I mean, he, black and white is still innovative, right? It's, you know, pretty interesting from a game. I didn't play the uh, one before that, Populous, or what was it called? I played Populous. Populous was good. That that was Molnu, right? Maybe. Ah, so, I mean, is there something positive? We, I mean, I, was, I, I don't want to get too negative about this whole topic, but I mean, you actually have seen from my last episode that I don't really think that there's a lot of great stuff coming out. I've kind of been um, a little jaded by a lot of bad releases, I feel. And I don't know if that's, uh, hopefully it's just a cycle thing or hopefully it's not like a persistent trend hereafter that we'll just have to shift, sift through mountains of shit, more and more shit just to find the one or two few good games. I do think what we're seeing a bit of is that I think publishers are increasingly impatient for games to get developed i do think early access functions as perhaps a crutch for bad game design decisions to push games out perhaps when the game's like design isn't even complete you know you asked earlier what early access is and what full releases are it feels like early access is an alpha where it's feature incomplete and full releases are betas where it's buggy as hell, but in theory, most of the features are in the game. Like that, that's kind of how it feels like now. But I really feel like a lot of this just comes down to quality control. I think there's been a, a degradation in general quality, especially behind the money to releases. And that is causing a, a, a considerable lack of faith in the gaming community. I think perhaps the bigger shift is that I think gamers are getting fed up with it. They're getting fed up with regularly having games come out that are broken and you know they're not willing to sit behind oh it's an early access anymore i think there is a a groundswell of frustration and disillusionment within the gaming community and that's why i asked you earlier alexi alexius if early access is actually a good thing for the industry because what i fear what i fear is that if it allows and incentivizes games to be released when they are not a good experience and I think what we've sort of described is a lot of a lot of early access games that do well. Either it's very clear that it's a very small team and people almost feel like they are a part of the development process. And so they have a sense of ownership with it. And I think you see a lot of that stuff in like the door in Door Fortress or even in KSP one. And is that good? Sometimes it isn't when you have the developers. I think it's better. I think I think it's better for gaming than the alternative when people feel like i'm paying and getting ripped off and no one played how like you've asked multiple times tortuga how did a game get released in the state did they not play their own game and i think that's where my concern is that is that if if gamers increasingly feel like i can't trust anything and all these games are coming out and they're terrible because they're messes i think that poses some really long-term risk to turning people off from buying games or or waiting a long time to buy games 
Uh, here's another question I have. How does this all work for console gaming, by the way? I mean, not that our podcast is focused on uh, console gaming, but I feel like late, lately a lot of the games I play, they could have, you know, a console port or whatever. I don't. You can't really do early access on a console, can you? Yeah, you can. It's just a computer. You buy a CD for a console game or a cartridge or how, however your your console works and see how many patches you get to download once you've installed it. I would counter that a little bit, Alekius. You can release a buggy product as a console game. I do think the fact that many of them still publish, especially for like PlayStation and Xbox with physical media, I do think that has some impact on at least games becoming feature complete. Like early access doesn't exist as it exists on Steam on PlayStation or Xbox. Like not saying games get released in perfect states. No, it's a fair point. You know, you don't you don't have a game in development for two years on PlayStation. No. Where's the incentive when it comes to the gaming industry? It comes down to the dollars. If I release, I have a good idea. I get some investors to fund me for a little bit. I spend that money. And I'm like, all right, time to go to early access. And there's a groundswell I make a bunch of money. I keep working on the game. I make some more money because it's improving. And I keep working on the game. And then everybody who's really interested in that idea has spent their dollars. But I still, I'm, I've only made it 60% of the way. But now I'm getting no dollars. Yeah, this is a really good point. Full release. Let's move on. Cough, Ultimate Admiral Dreadnoughts, possibly cough. They haven't done it yet. Yeah, they haven't done it yet. You're right. They, But my fear is when they said, like, here's our six-month roadmap. I think that was, like, damage control to say, like, oh, we're not really just releasing and walking away. Oh, I'm, I'm so afraid of that. Because the roadmap is not anything terribly. It's, like, to me, it feels like they're, like, all right, we're going to patch it and get it in as decent a state as we can and then just just go. I think that's one of the problems I personally have in the industry. And I I don't want to stay on the negative either because I think there are positives to see. But my frustration is I've seen too many developers, Paradox included with their extended uh, development cycle, where they never really make a tight, really good experience for me. And and I know that's not true for everybody. And I'm not going to ignore that. But like... I, I want a really good, tight experience. And I don't know if that's the case until the game has gone gold or platinum, which you don't hear that term anymore because nobody ever finishes their game anymore, which is, it's an exaggeration, but. I, I have like two two things that I'd like to discuss actually on this topic of two more things, at least. What about regulation? I feel like maybe this is the place where regulation could actually step in. When you see that the market is being has like this kind of dump of really bad quality, um, that seems like the appropriate situation for there to be regulation where you, I don't know, there's some kind of, there are people who are releasing early access games, getting 60%, dumping their product and leaving. You maybe can have some, I don't know, some regulation. I don't know. That, that's that's basically, the, that's the idea, guys. Regulation. You fill in the blanks. Tortuga's calling for big gov. <laughs> Just seems like it could be useful here. How do you adjudicate that? You, you, if, if they say they're going to deliver on items, then you say, okay, but if this amount of those items aren't, I, I don't know, if people say that they're delivering a product and they don't deliver it, that I think is is something that is regulated in other industries. If you say, hey, this is toothpaste and on the label, it's like cyanide, <laughs> that would be, you know, taken off the shelves. Oh, God. So if you murder people... <laughs> 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 Maybe we need to take the cyanide off the shelves um, in the early access sense. I, I think there is room for that because I remember a particular early access title called Motorama, which did exactly that. It was it was a, a cash grab. It killed people? N- no. It killed them. No, a cash spiritually, grab. Spiritually. <laughs> mentally. <laughs> I, I felt burned. Nostalgia. They played on it. I fell for it. Wasn't there a recent uh, F1 game or whatever that came out that like they stopped? They basically like, we're done like two months after it released. Oh, F1 2002. Tw- yeah, it's just come on, man. See, that's the kind of thing that we're, uh, I don't know. I'm not usually, I don't usually think that regulation can solve problems too much, but this seems like, um, I actually do think this is a good situation for regulation to maybe kick in. 
if people are over, if they're abusing, if they're abusing, it's a, really an abuse of the early access title. Uh, but it says like, actually it's games, even like Blood Bowl and all these things, like when they're being released and the campaign for Company of Heroes 3 doesn't work. That's a game which is being released that is, it's saying it's one thing and it's actually not delivering what it says it is. That's like false advertisement. I'm very confused, Tortuga. You keep like flip-flopping your hat here. You know, it's like you throw it on, you throw it on one political party's hat, you're throwing on the other party, then you're backtracking. Uh, um, I, I do think, so I think it's interesting though that you bring that up because I think there is room and there are ways to do this and they don't actually involve like formal government regulation. We already mentioned consoles. One of the reasons consoles don't have early access, such as it is, is because to sell your game, and this is still a little bit old school, and I, I, I think they've loosened up a bit in the last generation, but you always had to go hat in hand to PlayStation, to Sony, if you wanted to, to sell your game on their platform. Like you had to get approval to sell your game on their platform. And like, they were pretty stringent. Like they had requirements. They didn't just let any game on. There's a reason it took until what, like 15 years ago for indies to actually show up on any of these, these consoles in any kind of way, even just a handful of them. And like, there's a lot more of them now, but even so, like there are still a series of rules that a software developer has to follow to be on the platform. And that is true on Xbox and that is true on the switch. And I think the switch has probably been the most like embracing of Indies in the, in the most recent generation or Nintendo has been the most embracing of Indies in the recent generation. But like, you couldn't just expect your game to automatically be on the platform. And that also used to be true of steam. Steam used to have a very curated experience until they threw the floodgates open in what, like Oh nine or so. I think a big part of this is just the fact that like steam doesn't put any effort into, into curating their content anymore. And I'm not saying like they should go back to the way they were before where like, no, no one got on steam, you know, who were, who were smaller publishers. Cause that wouldn't be good. I don't think for the industry, but like, Hey, maybe there should be some, level of of steam doing something to validate that games are are meeting a certain criteria in order to be on the platform i don't know it's just a thought i I think you know to get your and maybe the mobile stores on like apple are a really bad example because they're flooded with a bunch of crap too but like in theory there's a bunch of rules that you have to follow to get onto apple's marketplace on on mobile as well you know, I don't know that it's a, a catch all solve, you know, easy solve, but it's definitely been done in the past. I, I'm going to go out on a limb here. Um, I think you've already said it. The market is starting to get fed up with it. The market is going to shut this down. Not that I wouldn't mind opening up a new venue for curated game content, if you will. But uh, like me personally, I, I don't want any regulation at all. I think we live in a golden age of gaming where the barrier to entry is so low that I just need to wait out the development cycle. And like a giant buffet, ooh, those muffins look pretty rancid, but that tuna tarragon, that looks money. Like I get to choose exactly the kinds of games that I want to spend my time on with just a little bit of effort and patience. Not that that's the end all be all solution, but like I was thinking about the other day, I feel like there's a lot of positive things to see, even though there are all these negative aspects with the way early access is right now. Ugh, you know, Tony, your grumpy old man is very disappointing to me. This is not grumpy old man at all. <laughs> I know. <laughs> let me let me clue you in. Like when I when you told me the topic, I went through, I'm like, let's let's go through my Steam library and the icons on my desktop. Early access games that worked. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah that's about 20. Current early access. Okay, about 20. Early access failures, 
15. I feel like I've been burned more times than this. The early access failures are fewer than the others. But I don't know if that's because I've been grumpy old man and I just don't buy into early access anymore. But I, I was looking at titles that I bought after early access too. Well, if you looked at any other product though, and you said you have a 50% success rate, I think a lot of people would say that's outrageously low, right? So like when you're talking about spending money, like sure, maybe, maybe a lot of them still pan out, but you're still in a failure territory, I think in terms of customers feeling good about it. All right. I want to bring up one other point. What about this? How much of the early access um, releasing crap has to do with the lower barrier to develop a game due to the prevalence of Unity. Do you think that Unity is actually creating an ecosystem for bad early access titles? Yes. Look at how many jank sims are out there. Like there's a whole sub genre of terrible games that are like people like because they're terrible. Uh, not just that. If you look at what was it? RPG maker, like Unity is the new RPG maker where there's just floodgates of titles. And finding a good one in that engine is kind of difficult. And I noticed actually that because people say at least that the two main game engines for PC right now are Unreal and Unity. I mean, like Unity is not just for indies or whatever. It's like everywhere. It's like ubiquitous. But I haven't noticed big flops from Unreal Engine, which is probably purely lack of knowledge of them. Uh, or there are games I know that have failed that I didn't know were made in Unity. I mean, uh, Unreal. But also, I think that yeah, Unreal games probably more action oriented, and I I tend to not play those titles. I wonder. I haven't looked at this. I should. I because I have some software knowledge now. I should actually look and see how difficult it is to code to like start a project in Unreal versus Unity. I know Unity is very easy to pick up, but maybe if Unreal is like harder, then you actually have to have more serious people who will engage in it. And therefore, it can't be just as much of a passion project. I think it's possibly that. I, I don't know enough about coding to, to assess the two against each other. Yeah, I think Unity is done in C Sharp, which is easier. And C++, I think, is uh, that Unreal Engine is in C++, which is a more difficult uh, language to learn. Well, but where, where I was also going to go is because Unity's in C Sharp. So... Unity is also literally a huge selling point. A huge selling point for Unity is the cross compatibility between PC and everything else, especially mobile operating systems. Mm. And so if you're going to make a cash grab, a lot of the folks who are going to make a cash grab want the biggest possible exposure and right now, mobile gaming is, and we don't talk about it a lot here, but like mobile gaming, I'm pretty certain is larger than PC gaming in terms of revenue. So I think like if you're, if you're going in it with that intent. It's a huge market and what mobile phones are capable of actually doing processor and graphics wise, getting kind of impressive actually. Oh, for sure. But, but my point was more of if you're going into it with the intent of like, maybe not, I don't mean this as a negative for folks using unity. Cause like, I'm pretty sure all the, the ultimate general games are unity and I love those things. But like, if you're going at it, perhaps with a more nefarious purpose or an, or maybe a less, a less noble, less passionate, you know, myself being a self-proclaimed guardian of, of who is authentic and who is not. If you're going at it with that mindset, I think, I think you're more likely to choose unity. Skill set aside. That's a good point. Oh, I had one more thing. I wanted to say that, that no, no, this is this is a good one though. You're gonna like it. Because it's actually me, it's me defending paradox, which doesn't happen very often. But you know what? I think that the climate of people's perception I mean, people's perception of releases is also a little bit off right now, I would think. Um, because Victoria three, didn't it release at like a sixty percent or something? And I'm pretty critical of game releases and I'm like very leery of like games that are being released in a poor state. I really enjoyed Victoria three. I have no idea how that only got a 60%. I mean, it's had issues, but it, the game, I, I think that that is a game which did release. Like it had some bugs. It, it was kind of a typical paradox release, but it's a fun game. It's pretty much exactly what you would hope the Victoria two sequel would be. Yes and no. 
So I think part of Victoria 3's problem was Victoria 2. Yes. Victoria 2 was released in an, it was released in an era when Paradox was very different and its fan base was very different. And catering to a large audience was not their core approach when Victoria 2 came out. And so Victoria 2 was very finicky, very micromanagey, everything that Paradox used to really be and kind of hang their hat on. But also it was a kind of niche community. Victoria 2, they've said, was like at the time when those games were coming out, Victoria 2 was in Hearts of Iron 3 at the time. CK1-ish was out around then. Like they were a very, compared to what they are now, they were a very small development studio that catered to a very particular audience. And Victoria 2 was the smallest of of their, their titles. And Victoria 3 is very much the new paradox in terms of sleek UI, automated systems, not micromanaging every little piece, not micromanaging every little good, and so and and not micromanaging war. And I don't think a lot of that hardcore fan base, which was the ones clamoring for Victoria 3 all along, were clamoring for the Victoria three that they developed. I liked it. I enjoyed it. I've played the earlier Victorias two for what it's worth, but I liked it. I thought it was fine. Um, I thought it was a pretty solid release compared to, you know, like, I don't know what was a buggy release for them. Imperador. I don't even think Imperator was buggy. I just, people just didn't like the, the game design wasn't, didn't stick. You know, that's funny because. Mana, mana, mana. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not even that big of a, I, I really didn't like, necessarily to play the game or whatever but i i also didn't think that that was such a disastrous launch i mean maybe this is again back to how steam rates games but i don't think that those games deserve to be rated that poorly they were like i think that imperator rome was just kind of mediocre at launch i think a lot goes back to expectation management yes uh, if i may break in real quick but how are people rating games so poorly if their expectations should be that there's just crap on the market already uh, matt started to get into it And I I think there's more there because it's not just the Victoria 2 community. What other communities are at Paradox? War gamers. They say, oh, Paradox makes war games. I really like Hearts of Iron 4. Let's go play Victoria 3. Wait, I don't get to play a war game? Yeah. Because the focus is entirely different. So you have that side and you have people who haven't even been with Paradox at all. And they're like, well, this studio is known for grand strategy. So they've got to have war. I I want a good war game. I hear it's more accessible. Let's jump in. And so I think that's hammering their reviews. Much as I don't like Paradox anymore because they don't make games for me. I have to defend. They don't deserve. Victoria 3 doesn't deserve that review list because they're still at 67%. So wait, does that mean you agree, Alekius, that the 67% was too low? Correct. Yeah, I th- I think we're also kind of, and I don't know if it's a new era, but like it does feel, you know, I watched maybe 10 years ago, I watched a fair bit of like film review stuff on YouTube or I forget what the platform was before, but there was another like video platform that used to have a lot of people who are making like reviews of videos and TV stuff just because I thought it was entertaining. Not so much because I was ever really a big TV movie person. But there was this period of time where those individuals really got into a funk. Like as a community, the content creators who were doing TV, film, like classic movie type reviews, they got into like this funk where like the hip and trendy thing to do was basically to just hate on everything. Like there was just this cycle of Mm. negativity around everything and piling on finding the smallest little thing and tearing things to shreds. I don't feel like there's a couple of exceptions out there in the, in the gaming community and the content creator community. I don't think in general, we've really had that same kind of reaction for games. I wonder if we're entering in a period of where that is not true anymore though, where like, you see a game doesn't have exactly what you want. And so you just tear it to shreds, whether it's a good or a bad game like Victoria three. I think it's a good game. I think it's a game that it probably is not for the community of Victoria two. They obviously made a strategy change. They're saying like Victoria two is more of a war game ish, but also big on economics. And like they made the point in Victoria three, like we're going to focus basically 
entirely on social society and economy. And that's the story we want to tell. I, I, I don't know. I just feel like, especially with paradox games, it seems like we're in this cycle where everybody just wants to pile on to every single paradox game and just be negative about it because it's not the game they want it to be. As opposed to just saying like, Hey, if it's not the game for you, maybe you just do what a luckiest is and just don't buy it and move on and play something else. But it like, it really seems like we're, and I'm not just talking about Victoria, but it seems like we're kind of getting into this phase where there's just a really negative vibe going. You know, I'm speaking to the young ones now. We're, we're just vibing, but like in a negative way now hmm. about everything in gaming. And I think some of that is is the fault of the way early access has been handled, the way quality control, I think, is declining, um, the way that companies are pushing games out to start getting revenue when in the past maybe they would have waited to get it to be a little bit more polished. I also think like a lot of the suits in these bigger companies are probably saying like, well, shit, no one else bothers to like quality control their game just because we have a QA team like, fuck it, just put it out there. We need money. We need to appease the shareholders. But like I also so I think like some of this is self-inflicted. I'm not going to say that like developers haven't done this to themselves. But, you, you know, I, I do think there's some of this is just there's almost got a hive mind mentality of negativity a lot out there. And honestly, sometimes we're guilty of a two tortuga. We talk about a game. I remember War on the Sea. We talked we talked about War on the Sea in this in this podcast. And it was very, very, very negative. And then at the very end of the podcast, we're like, well, shit, I got like 60 hours in this thing. Clearly, they're doing something right. It wasn't so bad that I stopped playing and walked away, right? But if you listen to a podcast on it, 70% of it is negative. And I think I you know, I was on three moves ahead when we were talking about Ultimate Admiral Age of Sail a little over a year ago. And that kind of went the same way where it was like we were talking about a game. We ended up getting to a funk for like 30 minutes where I think like everything we said was negative. And then like at the end, it was kind of like everyone's like, yeah, I kind of liked it. Okay. <laughs> Touche. I, I just wonder how much of that is like where we're, we're, there's this sort of ability to fall down the negativity hole. And I think to some extent that's true in content creator spaces. And I think maybe that's also true in like game player spaces. And if, if we're just in this period of negativity around some of these things, I don't know. And I, I think there was a spark, but I think it maybe has overcorrected. It could be true, but speaking to your own experiences, is part of that because it gets so close to what you want it to be. So you get negative, but it's not a bad game, but it's so close to what you want it to be. Well, from my experience, War on the Sea was just, it had some things which were obviously terrible. Like the AI in that game at release was just awful. I really do ask this question. I mean, it's not rhetorical. It's a very real question. Do the developers even play their own games? Because I, I, when people miss something, which is so obvious, like he, the person, and this is a one-man development team, right? Mostly, War on the Sea. So that's admirable. But he, he couldn't have played his game and like <laughs> and thought that the AI was good. It just, you couldn't, you couldn't have done it. It was impossible to miss that the AI was just terrible. So I don't know. It's <laughs> When you have something which is such an obvious miss, I think that's part of the reason why you might start getting tainted, Matt, like about why a game is good or not. If there's some obvious misses, then it's pretty easy to be like sour grapes, even though you're right, the game is still enjoyable. And I think that's on me. I think I need to learn how to develop a more, a better critical. It's it's kind of like maybe my ego. I'm, I don't want to say this in general. I at least speak for myself that I sometimes feel when I play these games, my ego is hurt that I can't believe these guys miss such a basic thing that, you know, I have to play this one silly AI thing for War on the Sea just because they didn't like look at the game. And, and I, yeah, I guess this is to Tony's point. I see how good the game would be with a great AI and it makes me really lament that. And maybe I like over fixate on it with this underlying hope that the game will be fixed more quickly because I'm complaining about it rusty wheel or sorry squeaky wheel gets the grease and all that i think i'm more aware of it because the last few years have been difficult for me personally but also was around the time that i gave up on paradox and i was angry for a while and i had to really get down to brass tacks of why and i i I think Paradox might actually be a victim of their own success when it comes to doing something new and interesting like they have with Victoria 3 or Imperator Rome. People have an expectation of what kinds of games they produce as a first party studio. And I, I think if they try to venture outside of that lane, there's a lot of backlash. Yeah, and I think that's what Matt was also saying as well. I have one final take 
a hot take for the, I know that we're a little bit over on time, but I kind of also think that marketing is to blame for ever, all the world's problems. That's not that much of a hot take, is it? It's like, you know, just marketing is evil. No, I, I feel the same way. But I mean, marketing is pretty much getting... I might work in marketing, but you know, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let, 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 let me elaborate a little bit. What marketing, marketing used to be, people don't know about your product. So advertise so that they know that it exists. And that, that, that's still there to a degree. But marketing nowadays, I feel like is mostly people may or may not want this game. Let's make sure that they want it when they see it, regardless of who they are, we want them to buy it. And that can also lead to this kind of backlash where let's say, I don't think this is true with Paradox, but I'm just going to use them as an example. Let's say that they advertised Victoria 3 and they did marketing for it. Did they market it in a way which would appeal to people? who would eventually not like the game. Who knows if the marketing people were really in the same room with the developers. Now, again, for Paradox, I, I would believe that they would be all in sync. But for a lot of these games, you probably have like a publisher in control of the marketing and they may be completely, completely out of touch with the game and they may not even care if they're in touch with the game. They just want to sell more you know, product. And then if that's the case, marketing is evil, it needs to go to hell and then we'll have a better world. Is that a good place to wrap it up, Matt? <laughs> go ahead go ahead let me let me speak in defense of marketing for first um i think what you're describing is brand marketing just to be clear uh product managers are also technically marketers even though they're not like the ones telling you like here's why my game is deceitfully great um they're usually the ones who actually like manage the features and, and define the product and and just to be clear i do i do product manager marketing so Oh my gosh, we don't get, get, get out on with your point. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but uh, what I was what I was going to try and say is I think to some extent that's true. I I would be just to be very clear. And I know you said you don't think Paradox is guilty of this. I think Paradox is pretty damn transparent with what they try to do with their marketing and, and their games. Yeah, like, I agree. I don't think anyone went into Paradox thinking like, oh, this is a war game. Like they were very clear war is secondary, like in all other marketing. It was all about mm -hmm. society, economics, all of that for Victoria 3. Like they were incredibly transparent about what the game was. I do think, and I think strategy games may be especially guilty of this, so, such as they spend money on marketing, that strategy games tend to be guilty of this. And not to like pick it pick on slytherin um because i do enjoy many other games but like i know when was it i can't remember when they started like this new trailer process that they used i want to say it might have been like panzer core one and they started using like all these stock images or other things like basically just like a bunch of world war ii like imagery or or photos that they kind of like made like have explosions like almost like they were trying to make them look like they were interactive for a lot of their games. And they did this for a long time. And I remember being a little uneasy about that. Just being like, that's not the gameplay. Like that's, that doesn't have anything to do with the game. There's no videos in your game. There's it's like they're turn-based highly static. Like I know why they did it. Cause if they just show a hex based turn-based game with nothing exciting visually anyway, like, they're not going to reach anyone who's not already buying their games. So I, I know why they did it, but I do think like, I remember looking at these and I'm like, I'm, how are you, are you going to get any good reviews on this? Because like, this is, this is kind of feels a little deceptive. I don't have a lot of like other examples to be like, here's other people who have done this horribly. And honestly, like Slytherin doesn't really use early access a whole lot. So I think they're like less guilty of pushing out, have complete products. I think they usually do a pretty good job with, with their products, you know, being ready when they release, like even distant worlds, like it wasn't perfect, but, and it certainly was buggy, but, but it wasn't like a half complete game. Like we were kind of talking about for some of these other things, oh, man, I don't even know where I'm going with this, but, but like in terms of, uh, in terms of deception, like I, I, I think it's easy for strategy games to feel like they have to be shiny and new. Like look at superpower three, like, how many of that? How many? How much of that trailer had anything to do with the gameplay in Superpower Three? No, we're not looking at. Super, I will. I refuse to look at Superpower Three. Okay, but I watched the trailer multiple times because it was in one of my most anticipated videos, and I'm like, it's all just like nonsense compared to what the game is. You know, 
<laughs> and I do think that's, I think strategy games suffer from that because it's really hard to show someone a hex based map and a turn based game and make it look, it's going to catch them like that. And they're like, Oh, I want to play that. And, and I've seen some discussion around streaming too. Like I know there've been a lot of folks, especially in the past where folks are like, I don't know how you stream these types of games. Like they might be okay if you edit videos, but if you're trying to like live stream a lot of these kind of games, I think originally for a long time, there was a lot of skepticism that anyone would would, want to watch that. I think some of us have proved that's not true, but I think a brand marketer is going to know I got to snazz that up. I got to make that look better. I got to like figure out a way that it's going to convince people to buy this because the gameplay is not going to do it. I think there's another aspect there too of chasing the market where I can envision a team sitting down in the meeting. I'm just going to use from the depths as an example, because they did something I didn't like, and I don't know why that is, but I'm going to use them as the example. So they sit down and they're like, well, the game seems to be doing really well, but a lot of people are complaining of difficulty in managing five different resources and that, They say that's very frustrating. I think we should go down to one resource. The developer's like, that doesn't make sense. That's not how the game was designed. But marketing's like, but we could sell X number of extra units if we just get rid of these extra resources for one unified resource. And eventually they relent. And that's not what was envisioned and not what the rest of the game was built around. And so it's kind of, does it make sense? And the, I think Ultimate Admiral Dreadnoughts is at risk of this too, because they're at risk of getting cut off of funding is what I think is occurring. And so they're chasing the market. And what are people saying in the forums? We should add that feature. That's what will get us money and keep the studio open longer. I think it really goes to quality control. And I don't just mean bugs. I think a big part of this is, and again, I would love to like interview a developer or a, a, a someone who, from a publisher who will never come on here because of the things we said in this episode. <laughs> I would love to interview a, a, dis- a developer or a publisher to kind of talk through this because I think part of what early access does when you release a game that's not feature complete, the game design has to be complete. And I think a lot of games aren't. Ultimate General's design fundamentally was done. Ultimate General Civil War's design was fundamentally done. But when you release a game and the design is not done, and I think Ultimate General or Ultimate Admiral Dreadnought was not, what you end up having is you have people who get involved early who have very strong opinions about the direction they want the game to go, and they speak up. And you're in early access, so you can change those things and you can make changes to this. And what you end up doing is you early access completely or or can does not always early access can completely corrode the vision of what a game is trying to be. And now you have design by committee. Yeah. Now you have Pentagon Wars making the, the Bradley and you lose your focus. Now you have Fortnite a wave defense building game. What? That's what Fortnite was originally. I almost bought it because it was a cooperative wave defense game. And that doesn't even exist anymore. But they made a lot of money. Oh yeah, I don't deny that. I, From a business standpoint, absolutely. But going to Tortugas, and I, I'm against regulation, but to his point, did they deliver the product they said they were going to? No. The only other thing I would I would add is like again, I harp on it. Quality control, quality control, quality control, and then expectation management. And where I go back with expectation management, and by the way, just to be clear, quality control doesn't mean it has to be entirely bug free. It doesn't mean it has to be entirely finished. Like I get the concept of early access, but like your design has to be done. You have to have a clear sense of what you want to do. And there are probably exceptions where people are like, well, this one time someone made a great recommendation and it worked out. But I think what I really, (laughs) sorry, Tony, I think what I really (laughs) want to get back to around this regulation idea, 
I'm guessing it was a pain for Steam, or maybe it didn't get the games the exposure they wanted. But you know what they could really do? Bring back Sue people. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Bring back green light, but for early access. Studios of a certain size would be allowed to put their games into early access. But I don't want to see any huge companies with multi million dollar budgets putting their games into early access. If it's a small studio passion project or whatever, like, and it doesn't have to be green light, it doesn't have to be whatever. Wall this off. Don't just throw everything in your store indiscriminately, like into your storefront where there's no difference between early access and full releases, and who knows what either of those mean. Have some criteria to qualify to be an early access. Have some criteria to qualify for a full release. Make it clear to customers what one or the other is. Help people out and help people discern and do your freaking job as a, as a, as a storefront. You know, like it, right now, Steam is like, it's like you walk into a, you walk into a department store and everything's just flung everywhere with a, with a couple of like, okay, maybe one section is for jewelry and one section is for um, clothing, but like, there's no organization. It's just all the fuck over there. And, and who knows what's made by a major company and who knows what's made by like a local company. Like there's nothing there. There's no organization. And like if Steam actually put any effort behind their behind, like actually helping consumers out in terms of discoverability of games they would like, which there's, I guess, an algorithm kind of actually discovering which games are in early access and which are full releases and discovering which games are, you know, maybe putting rules around early access where not everybody can just go to early access. I think Steam can do things there that would help immensely and might win back some goodwill from from customers and might yeah maybe it's going to be a little bit harder on certain developers but frankly if you're a big company i don't care like i don't have the sympathy for you if i had sympathy for ksp1 i don't have sympathy for ksp2 i don't think senor newell god of the universe steam just prints money man i don't think they give a shit i don't don't think they care yeah it does about the state of the store and all that but they sure will if 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 they start printing a lot less money because there's a general can like a general withdrawal of people willing to spend money on games because they feel like they got burned yeah that and how else are they supposed to differentiate themselves from epic games once epic gets more developed as a storefront i don't know i I've, how are they actually really different now i don't know anyone who regularly uses epic but yeah i don't think the steam has a problem um, not yet at least. And I, I really don't think that steam's going to do anything about this. I, I don't see the incentive for them. Basically, uh, it's work for them to do. I don't know. It, it could happen. I hope something does happen. So let me put it this way. Steam would have access to the numbers. And if they see like games are up taking like a huge trend in negative reviews and hostility, like you would think they'd be proactive and realize this is going to start costing us money eventually. No, I don't think so though. I mean, that's kind of already the state where. You don't think that there will ever be a period where people might be like, I'm not going to play these games anymore. I'm not going to spend as much money. I'm not going to spend as much time. Like if people are generally as frustrated as, as we make them out to be. I don't know. I don't know if um, the storefront will change that. I think that people will still be buying games probably. Okay, because I, I think that we're trying to make a point. So we're probably exaggerating things a little bit. Uh, at least I, I think to make my points, I was exaggerating things a little bit. I don't think that the actual state of the gaming universe has declined by like 30%, maybe like by 5%. I do feel like there's more lower quality games right now, but if I'm a gamer, I'm still buying games. So Steam as a storefront is still making money. I don't think that, uh, I, I mean, I kind of feel like the right now the onus is on the user, is on the the buyer caveat emptor and all that that basically the buyer has to be aware early access means you can get screwed and we've kind of just accepted that and that's just the world we live in now that yeah i mean we can sit here and pout which i like to do and i'm gonna do on this damn podcast i'm gonna talk about how much i dislike ksp2 and how it was released in that current state i mean i hope it gets better i i of course that's the main reason why people are upset is because these are really good ideas and then they are they do turn out like Ultimate Admiral Dreadnought's campaign, unfortunately. Uh, so yeah, people are upset because mainly it's it's something that they're really interested in and they get disappointed. I think people are going to continue to throw money at these things. 
and I don't I don't see how the revenue the only thing it could that could happen is it could shift somewhere else. I don't know where that somewhere else would be. You know, if if console gaming became like what you're saying, if it was like the console gaming has first of all, we're strategy gamers. It's harder for us to play console games. Mouse and keyboard is it's just very functional for a lot of the things we want to do for hex games, you know, complicated interfaces. So I, I don't know. I don't see a solution. Um, I just see us sitting here complaining about it. <laughs> Come back in a couple years and see how the, the state of the field has evolved. That's kind of why I don't. I, I took my ball and I, I went home. Like, how many of these games have I actually shown any interest or even bothered purchasing? I I, I live five years behind the times. What are we doing here, Matt? I don't understand. How? Did, what, what's our conclusion? I was gonna, I was gonna read the the John Luke Picard speech where he says, uh, you know, basically we've made too many compromises, too many retreats. The line must be drawn this far, no further. That's a good that, that okay. That's a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, in fact, we should probably just edit that back in like an hour ago. <laughs> yeah. Right. Make you laugh. Um. Can I can I get like a stock studio laugh? You're like filmed in front of a live studio audience. <laughs> so, uh, but I couldn't think of like how to do it on the fly with like inserting gaming references. Um, but uh, you know, I don't know, Tortuga. But I honestly, I don't know. I I do think, I think there is a point at which things will break, and I think there is a point at which some gamers. Not like everybody, but they will start spending less money. They will start doing other things. Um, not not gaming, but maybe buying older games or maybe doing things, playing that game that's been in their catalog forever that they never touched. Like I legitimately think there is a point at which which gamers will say this is enough. And that's why I was suggesting Steam would do something about it. I mean, I don't I think you're right. I don't think they're going to do anything about it. But like if suddenly over the course of a couple of years, they sudden revenue drops 10%. If they drop 10% in one year, I think Steam would freak the fuck out. And I think if a recession comes, which there's a lot of talk, not that that's what our podcast is about, but if a recession comes, it's going to be that much easier. You know, it's going to be harder for people to justify spending money on games that are not satisfying them. You know, and they're going to have less money to do it. And so I think that could sort of be pouring gasoline on the sentiment fire, too. And I think it's going to take it is much harder to rebuild customer sentiment than it is to maintain it. Once you've like if you have a positive sentiment, it is much cheaper in business. It is much cheaper to keep a happy customer than to convince someone to buy from you. And I think if if folks lose confidence in Steam as a as a platform of where they can know what they're buying and have have confidence in the in the quality, like yeah, I think there is space for an Epic or for someone who puts an effort a lo- a level of effort into their their content create or curation. I don't think it's immediate. I don't think it's highly likely, but I think it's possible. And you know, I. I I guess I hope that I like having everything in one place. So like, I, I guess I hope that steam implements some rules or I hope that developers learn their lesson. I mean, at the end of the day, if this really happens, it's going to be developers who are going to be the ones who are going to get fucked the most, you know, the, especially the smaller ones, they're going to be the ones who get screwed, but I definitely think it could happen. I mean, there have been video game crashes in the past. It's not like it's never happened. We'll see. Um, Tony, we're going to, we got to, I think we're getting a little bit over on time, so we we'll probably should wrap here. Do you have any other final comments you want to say? Well, I do want to thank uh, Alekius, Tony, whatever we want to call you, for coming on the podcast. It was a it was a good conversation, and I appreciate you coming on and sharing your your time with us. Um, did you want to? Do you have anything you want to plug before we let you go? Before we close it out, and before the plug, can we breathe some hope back into this? Like early access games that were successful or you, you really enjoyed. Like I'd like some hope I came into this and I'm shocked. I'm not the super negative one. I'm, I'm one of the ones that has a little bit of hope for it. 
Oh yeah, I mean, I can, I can. There's like some amazing. I think the ones that are the prototypes of how to do early access, right? I've already talked about Prison Architect, Rim World, Kerbal Space Program. I mean, these are the ones that jumped to my mind. Um, those were perfect. I mean, like the best. They're great games. <laughs> Door Fortress Two. Ultimate, granted, their early access was not on Steam, right? So, like, that was kind of weird. Um, Game Labs is uh, Ultimate General Gettysburg, Ultimate General Civil War. I think, so far, anyway, um, Gunner Heat PC is doing a really good job uh, with their early access. Um, you know, hopefully it turns out, but like, I think they're doing a great job. That's a, a tank sim game uh, with their early access. Factorio. Hard spaceship breaker. Oh yeah. Yeah. And uh what was that third? Oh, Mountain Blade. It's older. I'm I'm talking about the original. Like Mountain Blade. Early access. Look at what it's become. Oh well, not all of it's good, but you know, early access done right. Star Sector. It's early access, isn't it? Oh man, it's still an early access, but I have a lot of faith in that developer. That guy's a champ. There's a lot of good titles, but basically, I don't know. I, I think that um, those are those are good examples. Yeah, so there is hope, but I, I feel like that kind of like my focus on this podcast was just I was fixated on the fact that early access, I think, is just being abused. Yeah, and I think early access being abused has also drawn down the general release quality of of many non-early access games as well i think when you have this like concept of like oh there's all these half-finished games out there it puts less pressure when you're releasing straight to a full release for it to really be ready well you asked me if i wanted to plug anything just my youtube channel that's where i'm at i stream sometimes i put out a lot of content recently but that always comes in fits and spurts alekius a-l-e-k-i-u-s Put it into a Google search. I'm usually the blue dot ATG that you'll see first. You are the first. If you search Alekius on Google, you are the first result. But Google knows you, Tishy, so it, it might be. Oh, yeah, that's true. That's for my own. <laughs> that might not be true for other people. If I go into incognito mode, you're still the first. I wonder what DuckDuckGo says. There's also um, another place that you are popular on, Alekius. Another, I mean, Tony. Uh, so you're in, even in the title. Oh yeah, that's right. I'm in the. I. I. Yeah, yeah. That's true. That's uh, on uh, the Tortuga Power and Alekius Discord, which I believe both of us put that in all of our video descriptions. Oh yeah, you changed the name of the Discord a while back. I'm not on it anymore. <laughs> I got rid of Matt. <laughs> it's, Tony's a new one. <laughs> I still have my own channel. Still have my own channel. That's true. That's more than Tony has. All right. Well, I just want to say thanks to both of you for entertaining a negative conversation with me. It's been fun to talk about this. Thanks to everyone for listening. For Single Malt Strategy, episode number 78, Early Access or Early ass this is Eric Tortuga Power signing out. Say goodbye, everyone. You're going to really make me put that in the title? I don't know. Yeah, it's... um. Well, I don't know. Would it pass filters? Probably not. I mean, this is a very family oriented thing with it we don't swear at all is it i would I, I, I put explicit all the time you guys swore like several times i don't think we dropped any f-bombs no no no, no, no. i make my children listen to this when they go to sleep that's what they listen to the single mom strategy fun. oh man you're gonna have messed up kids hey you want to hear a fun story before we fo- totally finish and i'm fine with this being on the podcast too in like a, a post post by mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um so i have a i have a two-year-old well she's almost two uh and she has this little like my sister gave her this little like riding pony thing so she can like get up on it and hold the handlebars and like rock back and forth or whatever it's like a little pony um well anyway so she also has this like she loves sweeping the floor so she has this little like duster for kids i don't know where she got this idea i have no idea but she now thinks that she will not ride that horse unless she has the duster, which is a long object in her hand. And she will raise it above her head while she is on the, ho- on the horse and yell charge. <laughs> she's, she's been hanging out with mama a lot then, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. <laughs>
So she thinks she's going. It's also a, also a unicorn. So she thinks she's going to join the the first unicorn cavalry regiment. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> 